First, we created the cardboard house. Then we moved on to cardboard living room furniture. Shortly after that, cardboard bedroom furniture. Then we added a toilet paper fairy made from actual toilet paper. And then last week, we made a cardboard dragon that would sleep on the roof of the house. This week, we're going to be creating accessories for that house we have been working so hard on. We're making books, candles, and a couple shelves that will fill the home and make it a unique piece. But first, we're gonna start with some books. Having a ton of books in my projects has to be one of my most favorite things in miniature. However, making all those books has to be one of my least favorite things. I come to think of it a little bit like shingling. It's very, very repetitive. This is why I am so thankful to have so many of you help me with the Captain's Quarters book. Each one is unique and it makes the entire bookshelf have a lot of interest and it's just beautiful to look at. But when it comes to some of my other projects, I am going to have to make them all myself. And so I've come up with a way to make filler books rather quickly and also I tried to make them look a little bit varied. One thing you can kind of fall into when you're making a lot of books is that they all end up looking very similar. When you look at a bookshelf in real life, oftentimes there are different heights, different widths, different textures on the covers. And so in this video, I'm going to show you how I made a lot of books quickly and tried to add some of those variables. It's not a perfect process, but for my cardboard house project, I think it worked pretty well. So let's make some books. First of all, it's pretty important for me to know what I am going to be filling. I'm going to be filling up this shelf and I want to make some book stacks. Second, I need to make the insert for the books. That means the inside that represents the pages. I have some leftover foam board here. I'm also going to be using some cardboard, of course, for the cardboard house. And there is a process of using magazines that was created by Heather Tracy. I will link her video down below if you want to check it out. This was a catalog for guitars from like 2004. So I thought I would use that one. It's important for me to measure each shelf so that I know what height these should be. I am going to be creating three different heights. I'll put those on screen now. This is what's going to give me the varied height look. So whatever height I'm starting with, that is how wide each strip is going to be. Later on, I will cut these into individual books, but I'm starting with the height. I cut some cardboard pieces, some foam board pieces, and now I'm going to cut out a chunk from this little magazine. It's important that it is a magazine that was glued on the edge and not stapled. If it's stapled, it won't hold together once you cut through it. This does take some time. This is a pretty thick little magazine, um, but I don't have a lot of magazines, which is why I'm using this one. Otherwise, I'd be making a lot more of these little guys because they're so easy and the pages look really real. So if you have some magazines you're ready to get rid of, uh, you might think about making a few books with them. I'm going to be using construction paper for the covers of these books. The reason I started using construction paper in the first place is because kids tend to make like a little cut out of the corner and then they think the rest of it is scrap. Well, I would take it and then make book covers with it. What I'm going to do here is take one of my book heights that I previously cut and I'm going to make the construction paper cover twice as wide as my book insert. And I'm going to do this for each individual book insert height that I created. So all I'm doing is taking the insert pieces I previously cut from foam board, cardboard, or the magazine and I am marking a double width on my cardstock. Once I have every color cut out, I am going to take a straight edge and start folding the outer edges inward to create my book cover. I try to make my first fold about the, a quarter of the width. It doesn't matter that much, but I'm just kind of eyeballing it. I don't want it to be too much of the book cover that I'm folding at first. I'm using the straight edge with my fingernail, running it down the side of the ruler to create a straight fold. Then I'm going to fold the other side in towards the previous fold, leaving a gap. I left about an eighth inch of a gap. What this is doing is making sure that your book jacket is going to be slightly taller than your book insert so that the edges of the book jacket stick up 
over the top and below the book insert. And this will all make sense if you watch the video through, if it doesn't make sense right now. Here you can see the gap that I've left between the two folds. My folds are not even and that's okay. They don't have to be exactly the same size. I just wanna make sure that I've left a gap between them in the middle. Now I'm gonna take some glue and glue down each side and I'm using my finger to go over those folds to make sure that they are as flat as possible. This will make the best looking book jacket. In just a second, I will show you the book insert pieces as compared to the book jacket piece that we are creating right now. You can see that the edges are slightly longer and you can see them sticking out on either side. I am doing this for each piece of construction paper that I cut. They are all going to be different widths because they are for different insert books and they will end up being different size books in the end. Now I'm going to be taking some watercolor paint and this is to create some variation in the color. If you want all your books to be the same color, you can skip this step, but I wanted my books to look different colors. I like the construction paper because it starts out one color and then I can use watercolor on top of them to create variants in that color. So one book, even though they may be from the same jacket, one will be a little bit of a darker green and one may be a lighter green, one may be more of a yellow green or a red brown. And as I go down the sheet creating my book jackets they will vary as I go along. Here's how mine look once they're all done. Because I'm doing a fun fairy tale type project I'm not worried about some of the tie-dye looking colors. I think it'll be fun on the bookshelf in the end. Now I'm going to take my book inserts and I'm going to cut them apart to create the individual book inserts. So currently all of these are going to be the same height because I'm cutting them from the same strip of cardboard, but I am going to start cutting them different widths. And this would be basically how deep your book would sit on the bookshelf. I'm also going to make the books different thicknesses. And so I took that piece I just cut and I'm gluing it back onto the cardboard to create a double thick book insert. When you look at books on a bookshelf, there are all sorts of different thicknesses. You're gonna have some thin books, some really fat books. And so this is the process of creating some of those variations that I spoke about at the beginning of the video. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to make sure I have all the same height books together. So these are all the shortest books that I'm creating. And so I am going to match all of the short book jacket papers with all of the short book inserts and then I'm doing the next size which I think was the 7 8 size so at the top I have the 3 quarter inch size then I have the 7 8 size and at the bottom I have the 1 inch tall books and I'm making sure I keep the correct jackets with the correct books so it's easier to complete this process and also my little magazine book is a 1 inch tall book I do have to go back with some of the joint filler compound that we've been using throughout this entire process. And I am going to be covering three of the four sides because one of the sides will be covered by the book jacket. I'm covering three of the four sides of the cardboard book inserts. I wasn't really sure how I would like this, but in the end, they look kind of like a massive clump of papers. So I actually do like how the cardboard plus joint compound looks once it's inside the book. Now that I've done all the prep work, it's time to just start making a massive amount of books. I'm going to start with one end of my book jacket papers and I'm going to fold it over just slightly. Again, it doesn't matter exactly the width. You'll kind of get a hang of what width you like the fold to be. I also like to clip the corners. I think it looks just a little bit neater once the book jacket is folded. Once I have my fold ready to go, I'm going to use my incredibly messy glue to add a little bit of glue, fold it over, and I find it's a lot easier to use some kind of spatula tool. I use this to go over the fold several times to make sure it's as flat as possible and that the glue has taken hold. 
Once I'm happy with the fold, I can add the little book insert. I'm starting here with a foam board insert and I'm just going to glue that so I can see around three edges that the book jacket is sticking over the edges. Book jackets are there to basically protect the pages inside so you want to see the edges sticking out. Then once I'm sure that has taken hold, I am going to fold the book jacket around the book insert. The insert is the white part, the foam board, and then make sure that it is positioned how I want it to be. I'm going to use scissors to cut across a straight flap that I know is enough to fold in and create the rest of the book jacket side. I'm again clipping the corners just like I did the first part. I'm going to open it back up, make sure everything's still the way I like it, fold it over, and then add my glue in order to glue the side down. Again, the flatter you get all of these folds, the happier you're going to be with your book jacket. And I would estimate putting one of these little books together probably takes between three to five minutes. So you can estimate based on the amount of books you want to create, how long that will take you. Um, but once you do the prep work, it's so much easier to just blast through several books all at once. And I will show you this was, this book was made right after the previous book from the same book jacket. And because we use the watercolor, they are now two different color books. And so that's why I added the watercolor. It's again, creating that variation. This book was created with the cardboard that had the drywall compound put on top. I didn't sand it or anything, and it has this really rough texture. So it kind of looks like a book that maybe had met some water, had had some water damage, and the papers are really rumpled on the inside. Here is how I've completed the smaller books. These are all the smaller books. You can see the variation in thickness and um, they're not varied in height yet. I'm going to work on the middle size books next and that will give me my variation in height. I'm gonna skip over all that because like I said, it's very repetitive and I'm gonna show you real quick that it's the same exact process for the magazine insert. All I'm doing is adding a book jacket on top of the magazine piece, making sure that I have the jacket spine lining up with the magazine spine. There are a ton of little details you can add after all of your books are constructed. Here I'm using the side of a spatula tool to push into the spine area to make a fold that is a little bit more of a realistic book thing you can add. You can go back with some pins and add some detail to the spines. And then also I talked about book textures in the beginning, trying to vary those. So I pulled out a handful of books and I am going to add Mod Podge to their covers. This is going to give, and this is matte, matte Mod Podge, it's hard to say. And um, here you can see it does give a little bit of a shine. And so when the light passes over your bookcase, it will look like some of the books are a different texture, even though they're made from the same materials. Also, one little thing I like to do every now and then, I think I maybe did this to like four books, is take some embroidery thread and I like to wrap it around a book and this makes it look kind of like an old timey journal that someone would um, just kind of wrap up so that it didn't come open in a bag. And I did this with a couple different color threads on some different thickness books. And all of these things are just adding some variation on books that we ended up making the same exact way so that this process went quicker than it would have if we were trying to think of the design and process for each individual book. I had decided that for this project, I want to glue some of my books together um, just because it's kind of a pain to pull individual books out of shelves. And because these aren't particularly special books that you can open and see what's on the inside, they're made from foam board and cardboard, I don't feel that bad about gluing them together where no one can actually pull them out. So what I'm doing here is I'm lining them up on the shelves. I'm trying to get different heights and different colors and variations on the books together so it looks like a varied um, shelf of books. 
When I'm happy with how they look, I am going to glue them together. And this way, instead of having to remove eight books from the shelf, if I wanna put something else up there, I just have to pull one piece off. And I'm doing this for all three shelves. They have different book sets. I also wanted to make some book piles. I love book piles sitting around the scenes. I think it's so whimsical and adds a ton of detail to any project. For these book stacks, I made sure to only use the books that had the uh, drywall compound around the outside because I felt like it looked a little bit more like old books that had been sitting in a pile for quite a while. Now I'm moving on to making just a couple shelves for the cardboard house. This was highly suggested in the comments, so I did want to make some shelves. Shelves are super easy to make in this process. I used the books to figure out how wide or how deep the shelf needed to be and then I measured out how long I wanted it to be. And then I made a square with a line through the center and these are going to be my supports. And so once I have all of that laid out, and you can do this for any size shelf, any size shelf at all. If you make the rectangle with a square with a line on the diagonal, cut it apart and these will become your supports. So they're just going to go on like this. I'm going to be using hot glue to attach them quickly. And uh, again, this is just going to be a very simple shelf. It probably won't hold a ton of weight, but in miniature, we typically don't have to worry about that. I also decided to make a very small shelf for the kitchen area. I only have a very small wall that is straight where I can put a shelf on it, so I had to make sure and measure that. And also, because it's in the kitchen, a lot of you had suggested having a place where she could hang up a rag for her kitchen work. And so I am making just a cut out of a toothpick and then adding that in between the shelf supports. And this is just going to create a cute little shelf with a rag hanging off of it. I'm using some drywall compound, the same stuff I've used for the entire project, and I am going to push that into the corrugation to cover up the fact that we're using cardboard to create this. Once it's dry, I'm sanding it down, and I'm using our mixture, the same mixture we've been using, where it is half drywall compound, half PVA glue. I'm using Elmer's school glue for this. Mixing it together, and I'm going to be using a paintbrush to spread that all over the shelf. This is the mixture that's been hardening our cardboard so that it will last longer and doesn't appear to be cardboard once it's painted. I'm using the same brown I've used on a lot of the furniture within the house, and I'm just going to, once everything is dry, it's very important to let each uh, part of this process dry so that you don't trap any moisture inside of your cardboard. You don't want any mold growing. Once everything's dry, then I'm going to be painting everything brown. Now I'm going to be adding a little rag. This is the same material I used on the sink we created in a previous video. And I'm using hot glue to force the folds, just like I did on the sink. And then I am going to force it to fold over the little bar on the shelf. Here you can see me adding the hot glue in a few places on the fabric. And then this is very important that you be careful with your fingers during this process because the hot glue can be very hot through the fabric. I have a low temp um, glue gun for that purpose. Once I'm happy with how the fabric is looking, I'm gonna add some hot glue underneath where the fabric will be folding. And I'm just going to pinch it between my fingers and hold it so it will appear like it is hanging straight down once it is attached to the wall. So this is what will give it its kind of realistic look. And there's still paint all over my fingers. Once that's done, we have a little shelf that has just an old rag hanging off of it. And I actually really like this shelf. I think it's kind of cute. And this shelf will be a perfect place for books, but I did notice we have uh, some room left for something else. One of the other things I like to have in my projects that go especially with the fairy tale theme that I'm working with in the cardboard house is candles. And one item that I have in my house, this may not be a household item for everybody. It is for me because one, I have children and I was previously an art teacher. So I have quite a few 
broken crayons. Now there's something about a broken crayon that makes some kids not want to color with them anymore, so they end up being pushed to the side or trashed, but I like to keep them. I kept them while I was working as an art teacher and I would remelt them into something else. So I was thinking, I wonder if there's a way I can turn some broken crayons into some colorful candles. I did a bit of experimenting and honestly, I'm pretty happy with the results. So I'm gonna share that with you now. I do have to put a bit of a warning in this part of the video. If you are not an adult in your own home with a fire extinguisher and fire safety hazard knowledge, please do not attempt this next part of the video as it does require a fire starter device to complete. So please make sure and make smart choices and at least be an adult or have adult supervision before attempting this. To create the crayon candles, we're of course going to need crayons, and this is a fire starter. I prefer this to something like matches because the flame is further away from fingers, and you also need a hot glue gun. This is my experiment. I was pretty happy with how it came out, so I'm going to show you how to do it. To protect my space, I'm going to be using a metal craft pan. As you can see, it's been well loved. I'm going to be using this bottle cap, and this is going to kind of be my tray that I'm going to put my candles in. It's helpful if you have two crayon colors that are the same or one whole crayon. If you have entire crayons, I have broken ones. So I look for two that are a similar color. I do realize in the end that these aren't exactly the same color. And honestly, I kind of like how that turned out too. So if you have two similar colors, it looks kind of cool. I'm first going to use an X-Acto blade to cut the height of the first candle. If you add hot glue to the crayon itself, the wax just melts. So I found it is most efficient to add hot glue to where you want to add the crayon candle. You wanna hold it there for a couple seconds cause like I said, the wax melts and it doesn't really take hold until the hot glue starts to cool off a little bit. I am going to be making three candles in this little bottle cap tray. At first, it just looks like broken crayons glued down, but we are going to fix that. The next step is to find something to keep the crayon away from your fingers. It's better if it has grip to it. This one doesn't have grip, and at one point the crayon fell out of the tweezers I was using, so it is best if you have something that has a little bit of grip to hold on to the crayon. Then I'm going to start the fire starter flame and it is going to begin to melt the candle wax. Um, I was thinking maybe you could use a heat gun, but it would have to be a very pointed heat gun because it would start to melt the candles below. What I'm doing here is I am letting the wax from the candle that I'm holding in the grip to drip onto the candles that I previously glued to the bottle cap. This is going to create a melted wax effect. Here is where you can see that the colors are slightly different. Now this looks okay as is, but typically when it comes to a candle, you have a place where the wick is and that's burned down. I did find that using my glue gun tip is the best way to make it look like there is an indention where the wick would be in the candle. And here you can see that I have added that indention and it just adds that little step of realism to the candle itself. It is literally that easy to create a little group of candles from crayons and i had so much fun with this i had to force myself to stop making candles there are going to be candles all over miss periwinkle's house here's a different view for you if you wanted to see the dripping up close um, i am putting both hands on either side of the camera so uh, i do bump it just a little bit and the shadows are a little weird but i wanted to give you a better view here i'm using a few more different colors and i think i use different colors when i drip the wax as well and i think it just makes it very whimsical one thing I did want to add is when you're doing this, it is helpful to clean off your hot glue gun in between each candle. And I realized it's better to drip the wax from tallest candle to shortest candle. 
The reason for this is it doesn't make a lot of sense that the shortest candle would get wax on the tallest candle, but it does make sense that the tallest candle would drip onto the shortest one. So after a lot of experimenting, I kind of figured that part out. Um, but here you can see I'm going straight from candle to candle with the hot glue gun. If you do not want your wax colors to mix, then make sure you clean your hot glue gun nozzle off just with um, putting it into a paper towel and wiping the hot wax off. Do that before you go to the next candle and that will keep your colors a little cleaner. I also thought it would be fun to try putting candles directly onto the shelves that I created. And so to do this, I used a clamp. I clamped onto one of the supports and then taped the clamp onto something that elevated the shelf above my work surface. For this, I'm following the same exact process, except I'm gluing it straight onto the shelf. The fun part about this is I was able to let the wax drip off of the candle and off the front of the shelf. So it looks like the candle has been there for years with the wax slowly accumulating at the bottom and eventually going over the edge. And I think it, I think it's just so fun. It's so whimsical and I just really, really enjoyed it. I did the same thing on the larger shelf. Make sure to keep that flame. It looks like it's close to the shelf here, but is actually above it. Make sure to keep the flame away from the shelf itself. And then I also was able to make some little wax runs by using my hot glue gun and slowly pulling it through the crayon wax. So there's lots of creative things you can do with this. Just make sure that you're being 100% safe and have a fire extinguisher close to you just in case. One last tip, I did decide I wanted some burn marks inside my candle. Oftentimes they, they do look a little burnt after a lot of use. So I was able to put my uh, hot glue gun into a black crayon. And at first it was just a little bit too much, but then the second time around I wiped off a little bit of the wax and then put it into the other red candle. And that's one way you can add some color variation or if you want your candles to look a little older, that does help. So you can kind of mix waxes with your hot glue gun, if that makes sense. I can't believe it's the end of the video and I almost forgot to show you the little dog, the little fairy dog that goes with the dog house. I used this toy dog that um, I'm not quite sure where he came from, um, but I had him on my shelf and so I don't really know if he counts towards the cardboard house because I just started working on him and didn't really think through the household item process that I usually do. So I ended up using polymer clay on him. I wanted to add some horns. And honestly, I'm not quite sure how I would do such a small, delicate little horn in anything but polymer clay, but that's what I decided to use. And um, I went ahead and just used some little like teardrop shapes, rolled them out to be horn shapes. And then I also wanted to elongate his tail because just kind of something that's a little longer and a little abnormal for a dog his size. So I made a little, I guess, tail prosthetic type thing. And then I put those in the oven to bake. While those were baking, I decided to make him some wings, very similar to the way I made the wings for Miss Periwinkle and the dragon. I'm using toilet paper, and these are paper clips that I'm bending to be the shape that I want the wings to be. These are such tiny little wings. They were really easy to create. I just wet the toilet paper, and then I added some glue on top of it, and then added the paper clip over it, and then folded the toilet paper down so that it, the paper clip was encased in the toilet paper. Once this all dries, it will make a really strong yet really thin wing. If you want more details on how I made these wings and made them a little bit larger, um, you can go check out Miss Periwinkle's video or the video over the cardboard dragon, which I think I also pointed you back to Miss Periwinkle's video. To install the horns once they baked, from the oven, I'm just going to use a drill and drill into the side of the plastic toy. And these will fit right inside those holes. I tried to use a drill bit that was about the same width as the created horns. 
These were pretty easy to install and once they were in I just used super glue to make sure that they stayed there. For the tail it was a little bit more complicated. I glued it on and then once I was happy with it I used an X-Acto knife to shave down the sides and this was to take off a little bit of the width from the polymer clay being around the tail. I wanted to just kind of blend it a little bit more into the original tail. Then I took some wood glue and I put it over the seam. Wood glue likes to keep its shape a little bit better than PVA glue, so I knew this would fill in the gaps. Once the toilet paper wings were completely dry, I could use some scissors and cut out the shape that I liked. With the dragon wings and Miss Periwinkle's wings, I tried to make them a little bit like scrunched up, I guess, but these are just going to stay straight. Uh, because they're so small, I want to make sure they come across as wings and not just lumps on the dog. Again, to install these, I'm going to be using a drill bit that's about the same width as the wire for the paper clip. And there is one wing on, and I'm doing the second wing exactly the same way. Now that he's completely done, I don't want to change him too much. I still want him to read as a dog, um, but I do want to give him kind of a more whimsical painting. I'm using gesso to go over his body. The reason I'm using gesso is because I am painting on plastic and gesso gives you just a little bit better of a painting surface than plastic. I'm using orange because Miss Periwinkle has a purple theme. The dragon has a green theme, and so I wanted to go with secondary colors, and the last secondary color is orange. I painted the horns, I painted his little nose orange, I painted the ends of his tail and the tops of his wings orange. I wanted to keep the bulk of his body white. Uh, I thought if he was completely orange that might be a little bit overwhelming. Already the orange is just a little bit overwhelming. But then I went back with some pink and I think the pink helped everything come together and just gave him a little bit more interest than just plain white and orange. The pink kind of gave a um, I don't know if it kind of cooled it down because it's not a cool color. I don't know what it did, but I really like the addition of the pink with the white and the orange. Now we're at the fun part where we get to put it all together. I am going to be putting a couple little candles on the shelf just to add something a little different. Of course, never burn candles on a wooden shelf. That's not a good idea. Um, but I have so many candles from what I created, I'm just going to be putting them everywhere. I'm adding one onto the table and then I'm just going to put these stacks of books on the chairs and around on the floor. Actually, I think I only have two stacks of books and a couple for the shelf. Here's the large shelf and to install these I'm just going to be putting a little bit of hot glue on the back and then later on I will probably go back and age them a little bit just around on the wall where the shelves connect. I think this little shelf for the kitchen with the two candles on it ended up being my favorite piece. I want to make like 20 of them and hang them on one wall in a project. I think that'd be so fun. I'm adding Miss Periwinkle in here to add in her little dog that I ended up creating and he of course needs a name too. So I've got a collection of name suggestions in my last video for the dragon. We need a name suggestion for the dog. I really did enjoy the names that went off the colors because the colors were specific to the characters. I'm very excited about this next part because I received a package from Ireland from Eleanor. Thank you, Eleanor. She sent something specifically, well, several things, specifically for the cardboard house. She made some rugs from scraps she had from other materials. So perfect for the theme of the entire cardboard house. And I just love these so much. So I'm going to be putting them throughout the cardboard house. I think rugs add so much warmth and this one particularly is really soft. I think they just add a lot of warmth and heart to a project. This one has fringe and I don't know if she meant for it to be double sided, but I like the fact that it's double sided because then if I want to change it and give a little bit different of a look to a room, I can do that. And I really liked this one under the bed. 
She also crocheted this beautiful blanket to go on Miss Periwinkle's rocking chair, and it ended up being just a little bit too big for the rocking chair, but it absolutely has to be in the project, so I will find a way to display it in the project. So I don't know if it will be on the bed, although I think it would make an incredibly comfortable cover in the winter time for Miss Periwinkle. So I will find a way to display that beautiful blanket. So thank you, Eleanor, for sending those items for the cardboard house. So here are some final looks at the inside. I'm really happy with where we're going and I want to keep going. I think the cardboard house is really coming to life. And when it comes to miniatures, adding little accessories and details are what really start to shape the story of each individual piece. And I can just start to imagine now warming up next to the stove, the candles flickering throughout the house, the books stacked everywhere, and really just finding this little haven in the middle of nowhere that is Miss Periwinkle's cardboard house. I'm probably going to do one or two more accessory videos for the cardboard house. So if you have some ideas, let me know. One other thing I wanted to insert here is that YouTube has decided to stop sending out email notifications for some reason. I don't know. If you're like me and you rely on your email for information, I do have my very own email list specifically for my channel, Bentley House Minis. The link is in the description below. You have to be 16 years or older to sign up for the email list. It will also send out information about my store. So if you're interested in that, it's free. You can sign up and you'll get all the information from Bentley House Minis whenever a video goes up on my channel. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a part of my channel. Um, we really have a wonderful group of people here and I'm so thankful for that. So thank you for being here. If you enjoyed this video, um, if you'd leave a like, I'd appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one. Bye. I'll be honest with you, this is like one of maybe like five bags like this of broken crayons. Honestly, it's an untapped mini candle making market. If you work at a school, just tell all the teachers that you want their broken crayons at the end of the school year and the crayons will show up, believe me. So if you're looking for some broken crayons, get in contact with the school, maybe not this year, maybe not in 2020, in future years and say, I want some of your old broken crayons and you will get more than you ever wished for, I promise.